So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to this evening's Genome Science Department public lecture. So my name is Leo Plank, and I'm a, uh, a professor in the Department of Genome Sciences. And so those of you who come regularly know that I really have one task, which is basically to introduce the speaker. Uh, sometimes I have announcements in, in advance, and I've just got a couple of quick announcements. The first thing I want to say for those of you that come regularly to these, uh, these talks, our next two talks, the last two, are actually not going to be in this room. They're going to be in Hitchcock Hall. So um, if you come here thinking it's going to be here, you're going to find the room's dark. Nobody's going to be here. So Hitchcock Hall is really close by. It's basically just a little bit to the east of, um, of the Fagey building. So if you want to go to Hitchcock Hall, it's this brick building that's just a little bit to the east of this building. Okay? So you, if you go out through this lobby, you go up the stairs to the first floor, go out through the exit of the building, there's a pathway that goes uh, that you can go either right or left on. If you go right on that pathway, just a little bit east, there's a giant brick building, and that's where our last two talks will be held. Okay. Okay. So the other thing I want to mention is at the end of each of these talks, we actually serve refreshments right outside in the lobby, and the speakers will stick around and answer questions if you guys have additional questions. So I urge you to go out there after the talk, have some coffee. There's cookies out there, I think, or brownies. And, uh, and just don't be afraid to ask the speaker questions, because he's happy to stick around for a little bit afterwards to answer any questions you may have. OK, so just a little bit about um, Dave Rabel, our speaker this evening. So um, Dave received his, his Bachelor of Science degree at Cornell University in biology. Uh, he received his PhD in neurosciences at the University of Pennsylvania. He then did a couple of postdoctoral um, stints, one very short one at the University of Pennsylvania with Jonathan uh, Raper. And then he also did a second postdoctoral um, uh, stint at the University of Oregon with Judith Eisen. Uh, and then he joined the faculty uh, at the University of Washington in 1995. So his primary appointment is in biological structure, but he's also an adjunct member of the Genome Sciences Department. He's also got an adjunct appointment in the biology department as well. Um, so he's, I th I'm sure he's a very busy guy because in addition to running a lab and he teaches, which both of which can be full time, more than full time jobs actually. Um, he's also done a bunch of service things for the university, and, uh, and I'll just mention two of them. Uh, he actually is the, um, uh, the director of the Developmental Biology Training Grant, which actually funds a lot of the research that goes on for graduate students and postdocs in, that are working in developmental biology. He's also running the Cell and Molecular Biology Graduate Training Program, which is a large umbrella program that takes uh, a huge number of students, probably I think the most uh, graduate students of any graduate training program in the biological sciences at the University of Washington. Uh, he may correct me on that, but I think that's right. And it, it takes most of the students that come in that want to get their PhD come in through that program. And he organizes that program, which must be a huge job. I don't know how he does it, to tell you the truth. Um, that would probably be more than a full-time job all by itself. Uh, but he does a tremendous service for, for faculty here at the University of Washington through, through that, by, by running that training program. OK, so much of uh, the work that he's been doing over the years is focused on the development of the nervous system. Uh, and he uses zebrafish. You're going to hear more about that, so I'm not going to give his talk for him. But uh, he uses zebrafish in his, in, as his model system. It's a great mo uh, model system for studying development because it's transparent. So if you want to follow the development of, say, the heart or the kidney, you can just actually look right straight through the skin. And you can actually see those organs developing in front of your eyes. So a lot of the work he's done has looked at this, the development of particular cells in the nervous system called, called neural crest cells. These are migratory cells that form, say, nerve cells and uh, glial cells, uh, bone, I think, and cartilage. Uh, so a lot of work has been on that. But I noticed in looking at the literature that a lot of his more recent work, and I guess he just told me he's been doing this for more than 10 years, about 10 years, I guess. Uh, I just wasn't aware of it. Um, a lot of his recent work is on is devoted to hair cell death. Uh, and these are uh, cells that actually line the ear and are responsible for hearing. And so I think you're going to hear a lot more about that because the title of his talk, well, you guys can read it. I don't have to say it. So you're going to hear a lot more about hair cells when he gives his talk. So with no further ado, Dave Rabel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here this evening. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming on out to uh, this great uh, series. Um, so I've shown you a little movie here. Uh, these are not zebrafish. They're herring. And they have this really uh, startling behavior. And that is that they form these uh, big uh, schools of fish called the herring ball. 
And they do that because uh, they're trying to avoid predators. Uh, and by swimming uh, in this really tight fashion, uh, the predator is going to avoid them and maybe eat their neighbor. Uh, and this is a great strategy for against those tuna that just swam by. But it turns out, I, I recently saw this uh, Jacques Cousteau special on whales. And it turns out whales can induce the herring to form a herring ball. And then they become one bite-sized snack. So it's, <laughs> it's not great. The reason they can swim like this, though, is that the fish have on the surface of their body a group of sensory cells that allow them to detect the flow of water. And I'll be talking about them uh, quite a bit more uh, later in the talk. So what am I going to tell you about today? Uh, the idea of the talk today is really to talk about the zebrafish models for hearing loss. Uh, as Leo pointed out, the zebrafish is a model system for uh, many aspects of vertebrate biology. And so the talk is really divided into three parts. A shorter uh, introduction about hair cells, the sensory cells uh, that respond to sound and hearing. A middle section uh, really saying why people use zebrafish. And then the bulk of the talk uh, really is about understanding hair cell damage using the zebrafish lateral line system. Um, as you might guess, I'm kind of an informal guy, uh, so uh, please uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me if something's uh, really confusing. I know we have a uh, chance to uh, chat afterwards as well. Okay, so away we go. So first off, I think people probably know what the ear is. Uh, most people, though, think of the ear as this uh, fleshy outer part of the head, the pinna, while the hearing part of the ear is buried inside the skull. I think people are also familiar with the fact that the middle ear contains these middle ear bones that move in response to sound uh, vibrating the eardrum. But what I think fewer people recognize is that the real uh, sensory apparatus of the ear is in the inner ear. And it's in this coiled structure that's known as the cochlea. And if you look at a real cochlea, if you zoom in on it, what you see now is we're looking, we've peeled away uh, some of the, the bony uh, uh, casing of the uh, cochlea. Uh, this organ is called the cochlea. I think uh, it's Latin for snail shell, if I got that right. Uh, and you can see this, uh, this curved uh, structure. And all along the cochlea, are the cells that sense sound. These cells are known as hair cells. And if you zoomed in on a section of the cochlea, you can see that there's groups of these hair cells. We're looking down at the top surface of them. And as you might predict, they're called hair cells because at this apical surface, there are these protruding structures uh, that protrude out into the fluid-filled chamber there. And it's movement of these structures that convert the sound stimulus into the electrical stimulus. Uh, you can see this on this next slide. Here's a picture that I got from Karen Abram, who's in the audience, uh, showing uh, a close-up of uh, the, this apical end of the hair cells. And you can see these hairs, which are known as stereocilia. Those cells, uh, these structures deflect uh, in response to uh, the movement uh, of the sound. And that's shown in a schematic here, a really nice uh, movie I got from a site uh, developed by Remy Pujol that tells you all about hearing if you want to learn more about it. Uh, and it's the deflection of these sensory structures at the top end of the cell that are in response to the mechanical sound stimulus that are converted to an electrical stimulus, uh, a synaptic transmission through a uh, specialized structure at the bottom of the cell that then transmits uh, that electrical stimulus to the brain. So this highly specialized structure then converts the movement to uh, 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 a neuronal signal uh, that the brain can then interpret. Now hair cells are found all along the cochlea. I think this is actually shown in this really beautiful picture uh, from uh, Ed Rubel's lab. Uh, which shows the spiral cochlea. Now we're looking at it from the side instead of that top-down view. And each one of these green dots along uh, the length of the cochlea is a uh, hair cell. 
Now, the organization of this file is actually critical for the function of the inner ear, and that is because hair cells at different positions respond to different frequencies optimally. And so, in fact, the position along the cochlea uh, is a map of how the hair cells respond. So, as you know, a, a piano keyboard, the, the low notes are down at the bottom, the left, and the high notes are up at the top. In a similar analogy, perhaps it's not a great one, but uh, it, that is that the cells that respond to the low notes, the low pitches, the low frequencies, are at one end of the cochlea, the apex, and those that respond to progressively higher notes are found trailing along towards the base. And so this tonotopic organization, the organization of tone to place, is a critical function of how the inner ear works to interpret uh, sound. Now these hair cells, as I said, are critical for the interpretation of sound. And unfortunately, it's the loss of these hair cells that results in hearing loss. And again, I'm showing you two pictures here. Now one of uh, the inner ear of a mouse and also an inner ear of a mouse where the uh, animal has been genetically deafened. Again, pictures from Ed's lab. And you can see all the beautiful hair cells here and the fact that all the hair cells are gone here. This animal uh, is no longer able to hear. And unfortunately for this mouse, and unfortunately for us humans who have had damage to our hair cells, this damage process is irreversible. So that once these hair cells are gone, they're gone for good. They're not coming back in these animals. Now, this loss of uh, hair cells within the cochlea results in, in, in deafness, hearing loss. And this is really a startlingly uh, uh, um, uh, broad uh, effect uh, across all kinds of people. In fact, the disease prevalence in the U.S. is that there's, according to the NIH, there's 48 million people in the U.S. alone who have some sort of hearing impairment. So it really is affecting a lot of people at a time. And, and one of the leading causes of this deafness is the loss of these hair cells. So there are many causes of hearing impairment. And they're uh, um, uh, displayed here at what they are. So uh, one uh, whole set of uh, causes of hearing impairment is uh, our genetic disorders. These are children born with some sort of congenital hearing loss. Uh, it, it's remarkably frequent. It's affecting more than uh, one in a thousand uh, uh, kids. Uh, but the, probably the biggest class of people who have hearing loss are the aged. Uh, and uh, as maybe uh, I know, as I've grown older, I'm losing my hearing, and maybe some of you in the audience uh, have uh, had the same uh, um, um, experience, and perhaps some of the kids know that their uh, grandparents are no longer at good hearing as they used to be. Uh, and this is really is, uh, is a huge uh, and uh, really uh, impactful uh, problem on uh, people in this country and worldwide. One of the reasons why people lose their hearing, as I said, is because the hair cells are damaged. And it's because hair cells are exquisitely sensitive to environmental insult. And there's many different types of environmentals, but there's two that are particularly uh, effective at causing hair cells to die. And I think the one most people know about is noise exposure. I know that uh, many of you uh, uh, younger folk out in the audience have been told to turn down your iPods because that loud noise damage is going to cause your hearing to go. Uh, a major cause of hearing loss is actually uh, in people who use firearms, so those who uh, hunt or target shoot. Uh, again, if they're not using any kind of hearing protection, uh, you're gonna people, those people have irreversible hearing loss. It's also a big problem for the military. Those uh, who serve in the armed forces, again, are uh, being exposed to uh, loud, sometimes explosive uh, noise. And again, uh, irreversible hearing uh, loss occurs from that. And finally, then, there's this also this category of environmental insults, if you will, that cause hair cells to die. And these include certain types of therapeutic drugs. So 
although these therapeutic drugs are incredibly useful for curing certain types of diseases, they have a side effect uh, that uh, unfortunately comes along with their use, and that is uh, that your hair, the hair cells of the patients who take these drugs are irreversibly damaged. Okay. So uh, I'm going to spend now a couple of minutes talking about different aspects of this. Yeah, go ahead. Well, could you give an example of a class of drugs that would cause that? Absolutely. So the two, uh, and I was going to show this in a, in a slide or two, but that's fine. The two major classes of drugs that cause this kind of irreversible hearing loss are certain types of antibiotics, uh, particularly those of the aminoglycoside class. So those include things like neomycin and gentamicin, canamycin, amikacin. And then the other big group uh, are uh, certain types of chemotherapeutics. And the, uh, the, the major one is uh, cisplatin. Uh, cisplatin is terrifically good at curing some types of cancer. Uh, but unfortunately, people who are taking cisplatin, while they may have survived, uh, unfortunately uh, have uh, irreversible hearing loss. Oh, it can be uh, it can be all different uh, um, outcomes. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the whole problem of hearing loss is that there's a huge amount of variation. And again, uh, something I was going to get into a little bit. This variation is probably uh, connected to uh, underlying genetics. The fact that we are all different in terms of our genetic makeup, and uh, that impacts how we respond to the exposure to these chemicals. So people who may get the same kind of dose regimen will end up having really distinct uh, effects. So. so I just mentioned genetics, that uh, uh, there are genes that affect hearing loss. And uh, this is a slide, again, that I've uh, borrowed from uh, Karen, which is showing uh, the distribution of many of the mutations uh, that cause uh, children to have uh, uh, hearing loss. So these are. Uh, the representations of the uh, uh, 23 chromosomes of people, and these, uh, each one of these little lines then uh, is a position on each of the different chromosomes that, I'm going to switch pointers here, uh, that represents uh, the location of one of the genes. Now there's uh, now several hundred of these loci have been identified, and well over a hundred of them uh, have been uh, specifically, the gene underlying genes have been specifically identified by uh, people like uh, Karen or uh, Mary Claire King, who's also here. Um, so uh, many of the genes that are involved in this congenital hearing loss are known, and many of those genes are actually involved in this explicit function of those hair cells. Now I mentioned that uh, as we grow older, uh, our hearing uh, um, becomes less good. And this is a uh, graph showing uh, this in, uh, in data form. Uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, increasing uh, frequency, so higher and higher notes, if you will. And uh, people of different ages, different age groups, and their ability to detect uh, those higher, higher or lower notes. Uh, the detection is known as threshold, so how loud the sound is uh, at the point at which somebody says, yes, I can hear that, or no, I cannot. And I think you can see, uh, for example, in the group from 48 to 59, uh, that most people are better at hearing the low notes, the lower frequency sounds, uh, than they are at the higher notes. And that with age, uh, the threshold uh, keeps going up. That is, the sound has to be louder and louder uh, before uh, somebody can detect that. And again, you can see that this, uh, so you can see two things on this graph. As people get older, their ability to detect sound gets worse. And uh, as people get older, their ability to detect the higher frequency, the higher pitches, uh, gets even worse than their ability to detect the lower pitches. Yeah. So you remember there was that place map that the ones for the higher frequency are down at the base, and the ones at the lower frequency are at the center of the spiral. And yeah, for some reason, those hair cells that are down at the base are more susceptible to damage as well. Uh, and so there's a complex interrelationship between damage susceptibility and aging. Uh, but the fact that both are reflected in this 
low to high frequency locks, I think implies maybe that some aspects of aging is perhaps the accumulated uh, damage exposure over the lifetime of a person. Now the fact that as people get older, they're no longer able to hear uh, as well high frequency sounds has actually been recently exploited uh, by certain security companies who have developed uh, the sonic screen. This is a vandal deterrent, uh, which emits a high frequency sound to keep the kids from hanging out outside the Quickie Mart. Uh, so while the loyal paying customers, the older people, are coming in and not hearing the sound. It's kind of an amazing, I don't know how many of these they've sold, but it's kind of, kind of funny. But of course, as always happens, kids heard about this and realized they could turn the tables. And so they have developed a ringtone known as the mosquito ringtone that allows their phones to go off in the middle of class and their older teachers uh, unable to hear it. So kids can hear the high frequencies and the so-called responsible adults cannot. So it's an interesting uh, exploitation of this uh, differences in low and high frequency. Now I mentioned that one of the major causes of damage to hair cells is noise. I think everybody's uh, familiar with that, partly because there's been a lot of uh, uh, campaigns and uh, public service uh, announcements that, uh, det that are uh, out there to remind people that noise damage is a problem. For example, uh, the Hearing Health Foundation, which is a great organization uh, concerned about all aspects of hearing, has uh, the Safe and Sound uh, campaign to warn people against uh, the damages of, of intense sound. The environmental insult that we were just talking about before that's less well known is this fact that Unwanted side effects of uh, some types of therapeutics drugs causes hearing loss. And as I mentioned, the two big classes include the aminoglycoside antibiotics, including uh, drugs like amikacin and neomycin and gentamicin. And then the uh, chemotherapeutics of the platinum class, including cisplatin. Again, great drugs. People are being uh, cured of uh, life-threatening diseases, uh, but at the same time, uh, they're having uh, irreversible damage to their quality of life. And an example of that damage to hair cells is shown on the next slide here. Uh, so this again is a portion of the cochlea showing the inner ear of uh, an animal that's uh, under control conditions. And here's a picture of the inner ear of an animal that's been exposed to the aminoglycoside antibiotic neomycin. You can see the vast majority of the hair cells shown here by their little apical tufts. Uh, are gone. So I've really focused on uh, hearing loss. Yeah? Do you know why the drug uh, tastes like We're getting there. And let me, uh, at the, 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 the last part of my talk is really yet uh, trying to understand why hair cells are so susceptible to this damage. It's a great question. Uh, I've emphasized hearing loss, but I want to point out that the hair cells of your inner ear are also important uh, for balance. Uh, and uh, so here's a little, it may be his inner ear. Uh, and in fact, as people grow older, they also have, uh, are more susceptible to, to balance disorders as well. So this idea of hearing and balance both requiring uh, hair cells of the inner ear and loss of those hair cells uh, causing uh, uh, um, disease situation. Okay, so moving on to the zebrafish, why people would use zebrafish. What are they? Well, uh, zebrafish are uh, hardy tropical fish uh, found in Southeast Asia. So here's a stamp from uh, Vietnam showing a, a nicely oriented zebrafish with the anterior to the left. Um, and uh, these fish uh, live in rice paddies, uh, live in mud puddles, uh, they're hardy, they're easy to raise, and as a consequence, they're a common aquarium fish. They're a great starter fish. Maybe you guys have had these uh, yourself. They're, uh, you can see they're called zebrafish because they have stripes. The stripes are horizontal, not vertical for some reason, but still, uh, the black and white stripes give you the idea of where they got their name. Uh, they grow to be about uh, two, two and a half inches long. Uh, and uh, because of their hardy nature, they're great 
for uh, raising in a laboratory environment as well. One of the advantages of working with the zebrafish is that they produce hundreds of offspring. Uh, fish, as you probably know, spawn for the most part. They uh, have external fertilization. So uh, you can see here it's hundreds of eggs produced, fertilized, developed outside of the mom. And so as Leo pointed out earlier, they've been a, a great model for understanding uh, the developmental processes that are involved in uh, uh, going from a fertilized egg to a full-grown uh, full animal. And if you zoomed in on one of these here, you can see here the zebrafish inside its translucent eggshell. Uh, here's his head here, curling his tail around to the other end, already his beating heart. So really terrific the fact that you can actually see right into these animals, uh, as, as, as Leo mentioned earlier. One of the nice things about the zebrafish, too, is that in terms of uh, the genetics of the system is that its genome has been sequenced. And so uh, in a recent article here showing comparison of the distribution of genes uh, in these Venn diagrams, you can see that many of the genes that we have as humans are shared with the zebrafish. Over 70% of the genes between zebrafish and people are identical. And this is really quite similar to some of the other genomes that have been compared. So as a consequence, the zebrafish has been a great model system for understanding genetic diseases that affect people. And so there's researchers uh, all over uh, the city of Seattle and across the country and around the world using the zebrafish as a model to understand these processes. There's also been work done uh, to use the zebrafish to understand hearing loss. And in work done by Teresa Nicholson's group, for example, uh, they've used the zebrafish system to screen for mutations that block hearing to occur. So here you're seeing a movie of uh, some zebrafish uh, larvae. They're really now quite little at this stage, less than a quarter of an inch. But they're already free swimming. And I think you can see with every tap of the dish, uh, the sound that causes those fish to jerk away, uh, move away from the sound. So they're readily hearing at this point. The larvae, the mutants that are unable to hear, uh, in fact, don't respond to the sound. They sit down at the bottom of the dish. They also have no sense of balance. And when they do try and swim, they circle, they swim upside down. So a number of mutations have been identified by Teresa's group and others where these animals have improper hearing and balance. And it's turned out that when the genes underlying these mutations have been identified, they've turned out to be zebrafish genes that the equivalent gene underlies a human deafness disorder. And so they're mainly affecting the hair cells, either the transmission of the mechanical stimulus from sound or the formation of the communication between the hair cell and the nervous system. So we think even though there's quite a bit of a difference between zebrafish and zebrafish hair cells uh, and humans and human hair cells, they share many aspects that are similar, such as the genes that are necessary for the proper function of those cells. And as a consequence, we think this is a really good model for understanding the cell biology, if you will, of why hair cells uh, are particularly susceptible to damage. And so this is the point uh, where about 10 years ago, uh, Ed Rubel came over to my lab and said, Dave, you should stop studying that other stuff you're looking at and uh, think about using the zebrafish system to look at this problem of why hair cells are so susceptible to damage. And I became intrigued with the idea because of studies that have been done here and elsewhere by George Gates and others that suggested that the susceptibility of the hair cells to damage had a genetic underpinning. And so Ed and I embarked on a collaboration to look at the idea, could we understand one, why hair cells die, and two, what underlies this type of variation? And as you probably see, this is still a work in progress. But in the last bit of the talk here, I want to tell you about what we've uh, learned over the past few years uh, understanding why hair cells are susceptible to damage uh, using this lateral line system of zebrafish. So I started off showing you a movie of those herrings swimming. 
I think this picture of uh, fish in Australia really sums up the lateral line system. Uh, the fish use it to be able to swim in schools. They use it to avoid predators. And so here you can see three sharks uh, that uh, the fish are quite nicely uh, avoiding. Uh, and the sharks themselves have a lateral line system that they're using to detect the movement of the fish, their prey. So these are critical uh, 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 mechanosensory systems that fish use. And the way the fish are able to detect those movements, those disturbances of the water, is that they have on the surface of their body mechanosensory hair cells, the cells that are analogous to the hair cells of the inner ear. At the top here, I'm showing you a picture of a zebrafish at about five days of development. So these fish develop very rapidly, even though at this stage it's, about, again, about a quarter of an inch long. But this is already the fish that was swimming around in the, the dish that I showed you in that movie a little bit earlier. So you can recognize that it has a head and a tail. It's got a big black eye here that allows it to have incredible visual acuity already at this stage. And on the surface of the body, represented by these greenish dots in stereotype positions, uh, well-defined positions on the body, are clusters of these mechanosensory hair cells. One of those clusters is shown in close-up here, where the hair cells are in red, and they're surrounded by some specialized supporting cells in green. And you probably get a better idea of the orientation of this if I rotate it round for you. And I think you can see that these hair cells that are sticking out from the fish out into the water, that you can imagine as the water flows by, it's going to deflect uh, those uh, um, sensory structures at the top of the cell. And just like those hair cells in the inner ear, that deflection of the sensory structure is going to be converted to an electrical signal that via connections at the bottom of the cell is going to be sent into the central nervous system. If you took a section through this and looked at it with the electron microscope, you can see that the hair cells show a really uh, characteristic um, um, set of uh, um, structures. In fact, at this apical end, they have, again, these uh, stereocilia. And at the bottom end, they have the big nucleus and the connections to the neurons uh, right at the, the very bottom here. And if you just zoomed in on this one cell here, Looking at it in the electron microscope, you wouldn't know that you're looking at a hair cell on the surface of a zebrafish. And in fact, structurally, it looks essentially the same as a hair cell that would be in the inner ear of a mammal, including a person. So again, the idea that these cells at the cellular level, at the individual unit level, share this similarity made us think then again it would be a good model for trying to understand uh, this aspect of why hair cells die. So one of the first experiments we did was just we could squirt some of those toxic drugs into the water. They're swimming around in it. We could ask what happens to the hair cells. And right away you could see that these nice looking hair cells here are dramatically damaged. So treating them with aminoglycoside antibiotic neomycin, after only 30 minutes, the vast majority of those hair cells are gone. I'm going to show you another graph which shows you this relationship between loss of the hair cells and concentration of neomycin. So the more neomycin you squirt in, the fewer hair cells that are left. And this relationship between dose and damage is really robust. You can see that it's essentially the same because these error bars are showing you the distribution, the variation from animal to animal are pretty small. This means that this characteristic of dose to damage is something that we could use as a tool to ask, could we find things that change this relationship? So one of the things we did was, again, screen for mutations that would alter this effect. So the idea is we could find mutations, for example, that if we treat with low doses of an antibiotic, we see many fewer hair cells shifting this curve down, now they're more susceptible because they've had a mutation in a specific gene. Similarly, we could treat with a higher dose of antibiotic, one that kills most of the hair cells, 
But now if the fish carry a mutation, they now alter the susceptibility of the hair cells, shift the dose curve up. So even though we're treating them with that high dose of antibiotic, most of the hair cells are surviving. And some examples of that are shown in the next slide here. So here you can see one of these uh, wild type fish, as we call them. And remember, each one of the dots is a cluster of about 10 or so hair cells. And here's a fish that we've been treated with the antibiotic, and you can see that the dots are gone, even though that fish looks perfectly fine otherwise. And here you can see our two of the mutations that we found. So that even though we were exposing those fish to the high dose of antibiotic, you can see the dots are still there. Yeah. So in this case, right, the fish are directly exposed to the antibiotic in the water. What about people? So people who take these classes of antibiotics uh, are taking them usually orally. Yeah, so it, it gets into their bloodstream uh, and then it will go all over their body. But one of the places it ends up uh, sticking around much longer than it does in many other places and at much higher concentrations apparently uh, is the ear. And so because of that potentially uh, those hair cells are susceptible to damage. In some ways we don't have to worry about that at all. The hair cells if you remember the lateral line system are on the surface of the body. So they're seeing the drug right away. We don't have to worry about the kind of confounding factors if you will of that you got to get the, uh, the stuff, the antibiotic, through the body and into the ear. Here we're essentially dipping the cells right in it. So uh, I think there aren't that many zebrafish aficionados in the audience. But I think even the uh, novice might recognize that this fish down here is different. It's got this kind of curvy body. So it turns out that this mutation causes other deleterious effects, other bad effects in this animal. But at the same time, it's conferred resistance. It's made those hair cells stronger, if you will, in response to the antibiotics. So we've ended up identifying what the genes are, and it turns out that these genes are affecting two different kinds of things involved in the hair cells. So I'm showing you here a schematic of a hair cell. Uh, here's this uh, top end where the hair bundles are. Uh, here would be the bottom end where the connections with the nervous system are. And cells, as you probably know, are full of organelles, uh, subcellular structures that have specialized functions. And it turns out that the mutations that we found are affecting two different types of processes. One set of mutations seem to affect intracellular transit, how molecules get around inside cells. The other set of mutations affect ion balance, that is the uh, salt concentrations, if you will, of what's going on inside and outside cells. And because the mutations imply these two processes, we've now gone on to study in detail how those processes might be affected by the antibiotic exposure. So one of the experiments we did was to put a fluorescent tag on the antibiotic itself. So here we've exposed some hair cells to uh, neomycin tagged with a red fluorescent protein, red fluorescent, uh, and you can see that the drug is getting into the top end of the cells, and then it gets into the body, and then you can see this guy is not looking too happy, and all of a sudden it leaks out the bottom. So that's a dying cell. I don't know if I could get the lights down a slight amount in this room. That worked, whatever you did. Yeah. Is that better? <laughs> there you go. So because we can tag, we can put a, a color onto the antibiotic, it allows us to be able to follow this process essentially in real time. And because these cells are on the surface of the body, not buried in the hardest bone in the body, the, in the skull, we can actually look at how the cells are responding. So we're using this kind of technique to understand this trafficking, this intracellular transit. And how long does it take for that to be destroyed like that? Yeah, so this is minutes. In minutes, okay. Yeah, this is minutes here. And so you can see at, in under 20 minutes, this cell's dying. This concentration of, of antibiotic 
Some of the cells die and some don't. It was about halfway down that dose response curve. And so one of the things that this allows us to do is ask why is this cell dying and this cell right here not? Uh, and these are the kinds of things we're really interested in trying to figure out. Okay, but I'm going to finish up talking about the, about the ions. That is uh, this idea that uh, ion concentrations are affecting the hair cells themselves. And the one we focused on, in particular, is the ion known as calcium. I think everybody knows that calcium is important for strong bones. But calcium is also used within cells as a control mechanism, a signaling mechanism, to control many different processes within the cell. And because it's so critical to many cellular functions, its concentration within cells is really tightly regulated. So within the cell, the liquid inside the cell is known as the cytoplasm. Uh, and the concentration of calcium there is very low. And it's kept that way through active mechanisms within the cells. And one of those active mechanisms is that within the cell there are these organelles, these structures uh, that are distinct within cells that are surrounded by membranes that can take up and accumulate calcium. And the two structures that are important for the accumulation of calcium within cells are the mitochondria and the other are the endoplasmic reticulum. So the thing you need to know here is that normally uh, calcium is low in the cytoplasm and it's high in these two structures, the mitochondria and the ER as we like to call it. Now we were wondering if the ion concentrations are disrupted in cells as they're dying, could we actually visualize this? So we took advantage of a trick uh, that was recently invented by some other people to use a protein uh, that changes its uh, fluorescence, changes its color, if you will, when it binds calcium. And so this protein is known as G-CAMP. And when calcium binds to it, it goes from being dull to bright. And because this is a protein, we can put it in specific places within the cell. And we can ask what's happening to the calcium uh, over time. And so now I'm going to show you another movie. Uh, and this now we're looking kind of at the top down on that one of those clusters of hair cells. And they're expressing this protein. Now we have a little scale bar over here. So not very much calcium binding is kind of in the blue color. And a lot of calcium is in the red. So now we're going to put in some antibiotic and ask what happens. So here we go. We added the antibiotic. And I think you can see that these cells get really red before they die. And so if you measure, if you use uh, uh, photo detectors to measure how much fluorescence is changing, you can see that the dying cells show a big peak in intensity, while the living cells are flatlining. So you add in the antibiotic, and they're going. Now, I think as you watch the movie, it kind of looked like a firework or something, right? That the cells were flashing really kind of almost randomly. And if you looked at that on the timeline, you're now looking at 15 dying cells. After you add in the drug, you can see the peaks are happening all over the time. There's not really a good relationship between drug addition and when the cells uh, flash. However, if you looked at the relationship in a different way, that is when the cells are dying, you can see actually that this is a really reproducible phenomenon. And that is just before the cells die. Now, when we align all those peaks to death, you can see that about 10 minutes before the cell dies, it's starting now to increase its, its fluorescence. There's a big amount at 5, and then just before it dies, it's really totally peaked. So what is happening at this stage here, at this very end, they are now essentially uh, uh, falling apart you will. But the question is, why does the calcium do that? So at this stage, we're saying, look, there's a big peak. There's a big change in calcium. Is that actually important for the cells dying? So we used a special reagent to alter the calcium within cells. And this is known as cage calcium. And the cage calcium has this chemical structure surrounding the calcium, buffering it, keeping it away. Uh, from the rest of the cell. 
keeping it uh, the cell safe from the what the calcium might be doing. Uh, and then if you splash a light on it, this group disappears, and now the calcium's free out of its cage and can cause its damage. And actually, there's two flavors of this. There's one that's empty, and then if you shine the light on it, it automatically gobbles up all the calcium. So we have two reagents, ones that increase calcium and one that decreases calcium. And sure enough, if you change the calcium concentration, you affect how the cells respond to the antibiotic. So again, this is the dose response curve. And just like we were talking about in terms of the genetics, if you shift this down, now the cells are more susceptible to damage when you add less drug. And so raising the calcium causes the cells to be more susceptible to damage. If you lower the calcium, you see the opposite. You're shifting the curve up. That is, for the same concentration of, of drug, the cells are a lot less likely to die. So not only is there this correlation that we see the calcium flash before cells die, if we actually go in and manipulate the calcium concentrations, the cells are responding differentially to the antibiotic exposure. So we think taken together, this data suggests that really the handling of calcium inside the cell is one of the critical events involved in how those cells die. Now, I said that the mitochondria and the um, ER are chock full of calcium, while the cytoplasm, what we've been monitoring, uh, has very little. So the next question was, well, is because is, is we seeing that big increase in calcium because the ER and the mitochondria are dumping it? So instead of putting the green detector in the cytoplasm, we stuck the green detector either in the mitochondria or in the ER itself. And so we then could monitor what's happening with calcium in these distinct locations in the cell. And what we found, as maybe we predicted, is that in fact the ER, which is normally chock full of calcium, so you can see the ER is, there's lots of red, that these cells over time get dim, as if they're losing calcium. So maybe that's the source. What about the mitochondria? They're normally pretty full of calcium. In fact, what we found was something a bit unexpected. And that is not that the mitochondria were dumping calcium, but in fact we saw them increase their calcium first, and then it go down. And again, if we line everything up, we can see that the endoplasmic reticulum is dumping calcium, and the mitochondria show this peak in calcium, and then it goes down, and this peak is occurring before we see it in the cytoplasm. So it's almost as if the calcium is rushing to the cytoplasm via the mitochondria. So normally people think that these organelles within cells are kind of distinct from one another. But what's recently been recognized is that there are specialized junctions between the ER and the mitochondria that allow them to communicate back and forth with one another. And they're important for the regulation of mitochondrial function. And it turns out one of the things that's used to communicate back and forth between the mitochondria and the ER is actually the calcium ion itself. So you squirt a little bit of calcium into mitochondria, they work harder. And so that is a critical control mechanism that appears to be disrupted, gone wrong in cells. And so sure enough, if we look at mitochondria, and we add neomycin, they, they work harder and harder. They become redder and redder until that cell dies. And I think that happened, right? Did I miss it? Pull a loop? No? Here you can see this cell is going to work harder and harder and harder. And then, boom. OK. So the thing is, it turns out that there are specific drugs that interfere with this connection between the ER and the mitochondria. There are two that actually promote the exchange of calcium from one to the other, and there are two that block the exchange. So we did an experiment, which is, if we're promoting the exchange, we're pumping more calcium in the mitochondria, how, that, how would that affect the susceptibility to antibiotics? Or, if we block the exchange, how does that affect the susceptibility to antibiotics? So right, we think more calcium in mitochondria is bad, so blocking it should protect. If more calcium in the mitochondria is bad, promoting it 
should make it worse. And sure enough, that was exactly what happened. So the drugs that promoted shift the dose response curve down. You can see at lower doses, they're more susceptible. While drugs that protect shifting the curve up are those that block the mitochondrial uh, ER exchange. So this suggests we've really gotten a handle now on what the cell biology is. It's this calcium flux between these organs that's being disrupted by antibiotics. Now the interesting thing is that we can add in small molecules that actually affect that and maybe you then would be therapeutic. Yeah. There is. It's quite interesting uh, that in fact the hair structure itself one of the things that happens to it is when it moves, it lets calcium in from outside the cell to the inside. And there's these specialized pumps that are concentrated uh, on the top of the cell that try and get rid of that as well. In fact, this mechanism of pumping calcium into mitochondria, regulating mitochondrial function, might be an important thing that hair cells normally need to do in response to activity. And in fact, the antibiotic has taken that normal mechanism of response. The hair cells have more or less calcium, and they use that to regulate how well they should be working. And now it's totally screwed that up. And maybe that's why hair cells are so susceptible. So I wanted to point out that we can use these drugs to make hair cells safer from the ravages of the antibiotic. Now the problem is that these drugs here are disrupting a critical function of the cell. But if we could get away with it, it would be nice to take some of these drugs and give them to people at the same time that they're taking the antibiotics. Because the antibiotics would do their thing killing the bacteria, but it might protect the hair cells from dying. So conceptually, coming up with something you could take along with antibiotics that blocks hair cell death would be a terrific way potentially, uh, from causing this unwanted side effect. So we took on another project that I'm going to talk about in the last couple of minutes, and that is using the fact that these zebrafish are so small, we can look at many combinations of potential therapeutic drugs and ask, do any of them protect the hair cells from damage? So we can look at lots and lots of different kinds of chemicals, and we can put them in these many small plates, and we can ask normally if you treat hair cells with antibiotic, the hair cells die. And then we look through the wells and try and find the few where we've added some kind of drug that stopped the hair cells from dying. And we did that. And what we found is when we looked at over 10,000 different compounds, we found these two chemicals that, uh, for the organic chemists in the audience, they're benzothiophene carboxamides. I had to practice that, but I was able to recognize that this side of the molecule looked kind of the same. And the fact that this side of the molecule looked kind of the same meant that maybe we had some specificity. And we can do lots of experiments in zebrafish, like this one here, asking if we add in the drug, do we shift the dose response curve up? Do we protect the hair cells? And sure enough, we do. Now that's great. Maybe we found a drug now that will cure zebrafish. But of course, we really wanted to know whether it would have any effects on mammals, animals closer to people. Yeah. Does this have any effect on healthy hair cells? At this point, we don't think so. Uh, although that's one of the things that as we go further with the project, it would be really important to know. It would also be important to know, does these drugs do anything else <laughs> to healthy? So we do have ways of testing hair cell function in mammals. And one of those ways is known as the auditory evoked brainstem response. And it turns out if you give people sounds of varying volumes and you put some electrodes on their scalp, you can detect changes in electrical activity that correspond to activity in the brain. And these are known as evoked potentials. It's kind of like an EEG, if you've ever heard of that. 
And you can do the same thing with rats. You can record from specific locations on their skin as you're giving them different sounds. And if you increase the loudness of the sounds at some point, when you go from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60, now you're starting to see a really characteristic wave. Now, you have to give them many sounds over many different repetitions and then average it to get this sound, this characteristic wave to come out. But nevertheless, it allows you to know, hey, can the rat hear something or not uh, at a specific frequency, a tone that you give it. And so sure enough, if you give an animal uh, this test, you can see that they can hear over a range of frequencies. But if you give the animal a course of antibiotics, similar to the course of antibiotics that a patient would take, their ability to hear the sound becomes much worse. The threshold, the sound at loudness at which they're able to detect it, or you're able to detect it by the ABR, is much higher. However, if you had given the same antibiotic with our special chemical, it's much closer to uh, what the control animals are like. So this is really encouraging. It's a long way from the clinic, but it suggests that a drug that we could find in a zebrafish screen is actually protecting hair cells in an animal like a rat, which is much more close to us in terms of how we hear. We've gone on now to try and make a whole bunch of variants of those drugs, and we've tested all different combinations, and we found some that work at much lower concentrations and improve the hair cell survival of the zebrafish. And we're really interested in knowing whether any of these will actually uh, become uh, potential candidates uh, for down the line uh, people. So I couldn't end the talk by telling you that zebrafish have one other special uh, characteristic, and that is in contrast to us, remember I told you that once our hair cells are gone, they're gone for good? The zebrafish, here you can see the cluster of hair cells here, you kill them with the antibiotic, but then you wait 24 hours, and a bunch more cells are back. In 48 hours, there's even more. So the zebrafish are able to regenerate their hair cells in a situation where we would never be able to do so. And so we have a whole other set of projects that I'm not going to tell you about about how come the hair cells of the zebrafish can come back. So I hope I've convinced you that the fish system is a good one for trying to understand why hair cells die and could potentially be a good system to understand why hair cells are able to come back. And that understanding these processes and screening uh, for genes and small molecules are potentially going to tell us more about why humans are so susceptible to damage. And so uh, we're hoping that this will get us somewhere in the future. I want to thank a lot of people. First, I want to thank you for listening to me. I want to thank the fish. I want to thank uh, the people in the lab who have worked on both hair cell death and hair cell regeneration. I want to thank Dave White and the zebrafish facility who takes care of our fish. I want to uh, thank uh, our the people who have funded the work, including NIH, the Hearing Health Foundation, Action on Hearing Loss. I told you that all this work has been in collaboration with Ed Rubel. Julian Simon is a chemist who is down at the Fred Hutch, who has collaborated with us. Uh, and we have recently uh, started a uh, company um, that uh, is working to um, uh, translate some of those small molecules uh, into potential therapeutics uh, and as, as such that's actually a conflict of interest what I told you today uh, about the small molecules uh, although uh, is uh, uh, because I'm one of the founders uh, could influence what I said <laughs> it did not I'll tell you and so with that uh, I like to say <laughs> the end So we, we could take a few questions and then uh, and then we'll take a, and then we can adjourn to the lobby outside and you can take additional questions out there. Okay. So why don't we take a few questions right now? Sure.
That's a great question. So it would be kind of bad to come up with a drug that protects hair cells, but also protects the uh, bacteria. And so we've done that test, at least in a, uh, in a um, Petri dish. And the drug doesn't seem to affect the uh, bacteria at all. They're perfectly uh, willing to die in the presence <laughs> of the drug and exposure to antibiotic. So it's a great point, yeah. You'd hate to cure bacteria as well as hair cells. Yeah. OK, there's cookies outside. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks again. Happy to really stick around and uh, tell you more.